Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. It's often said that the best path to learning is by doing. Well, today we have a couple of examples of learning by doing involving students in the equine science program at the University of Vermont. The students have their traditional classes, but they say it's the hands-on part of their education that makes the difference. We begin with this report from Keith Silva and photographer Rebecca Gollin. Can I have you say and spell your name first and last, please? Yep. So my name is Grace Levy, uh, G-R-A-C-E. There's a first time for everything. And for Grace Levy, so this is her back, first TV interview. Um, sort of. And where are you from, Grace? The more you can help the person ignore this, or the more you can ignore it yourself, the better off you're going to be. Uh, hmm. I don't think I've ever really been interviewed before, but um, I mean, I think it is, it's a great skill to have. Even if there's not a camera involved, um, it's so, good to be able to talk um, to um, different people you interact with uh, and yeah, good right. skill just in general to be able to talk and make sure you can stay on track and just be comfortable talking to new people. Levy is enrolled in equine industry issues. The class is taught by UVM Department of Animal Science professor Betsy Green. For today's class on media training, Green has stepped aside and left the class in the capable hands of Across the Fence associate editor Rebecca Gollin and some other guy. When you're doing this by yourself, and a lot of times in Vermont, when not staging faux TV interviews, the class covers everything from horse health to the financial and political impact the equine industry has in Vermont. Uses to preserve the farmland and keep Vermont an ag state. I am a student, but I'm coming up, and I want to be in the horse industry. Um, and I think addressing the big issues from the beginning will help, so that by the time I am established in the industry, I know I've had a say in what's going on with laws and how the rest of society views the horse industry. One of the projects the students are working on is to advocate for a bill currently in the Vermont legislature which would allow horse facilities to be considered in Vermont's value appraisal program known as current use. The program allows for fair taxation of agriculture and forest land based on the use value and not the development value. House Bill 202 has been proposed to include facilities that train or board more than four horses to be taxed as current use properties. For their part, the students have been surveying horse owners over the phone and through email to get the word out about this pending legislation. And I would say someone who's more established in the horse industry will have um, more influence, but um, everyone's voice matters. Um, so speaking up, trying to figure out where I stand and what I want to do with horses and what I want to do, I feel like that definitely matters now. The camera Lauren Drassler is from Springfield, other, Vermont. I never thought about, about horse owners being excluded from current use. Mm -hmm. I never knew what current use was before taking this class. So um, I guess, I mean, I think it's kind of unfair that they're not included. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really kind of broadened my horizons as far as learning about it. I think if someone is really interested in this issue, make it a point to get that known. Call your legislator, speak about it, email them. I mean, we live in Vermont, so it's kind of easy to access our legislators, which is awesome. It's one of the things I love about this state. Mm -hmm. So um, I think when you call somebody, it really lets them know that, hey, this is an issue that I'm interested in. And I mean, yeah, I may just be a senior at EVM, but if 10, 15 other people call, then I think people might, like, perk up their ears and kind of be aware. Like many college seniors, Drassler hasn't decided what she wants to do after graduation, with the exception she knows she wants to work with horses or be involved in the horse industry. For now, that means working in the state where she was raised and went to school. What does it mean to be a Vermonter attending the University of Vermont? I think, I mean, I find it to be kind of special, to be honest. Um, this, I've done some research on the statistics, and the University of Vermont really doesn't have that many in-state students. So being a part of that community, like, I kind of, I don't know if I've intentionally or unintentionally done this, but a lot of my friends are Vermonters as well, and they're people I didn't know from high school or from before that. So I think that's pretty cool that um, there aren't that many other kids that are from Vermont, so I've really enjoyed that. And, like, especially in the animal science department, a lot of what we learn about is Vermont-based. So like the dairy industry or the horse industry, there's a lot of that in Vermont. So it's, it's kind of cool to be like, hey, I've heard of that farm before, or hey, like, I know those horse people. A class like equine industry issues broadens a student's vision, 
allows them to become advocates and engages them in the world beyond the classroom. Today, they're students. Tomorrow, they'll be experts in an industry where they'll need to know how to talk to politicians and on occasion, TV reporters from places across the fence. At the University of Vermont, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Well, joining me now is UVM Extension Equine Specialist, Professor Betsy Green. Welcome to you. Thank you. And you brought a guest. Yes, I have Melissa Beckett with me. She's a senior in animal science, graduating this spring. And she has been my undergraduate TA in one of my classes. And now she's doing a semester-long internship built around everything equine, the front and back side of it. Mm -hmm. And she's actually even doing, as a part of that, presentation on kissing spine at everything equine. Well, welcome, Melissa. How did you get interested in kissing spine disease? Well, I have a nine-year-old American saddlebred, and I did what everybody said you should never do with horses, and I bought him sight unseen off the good word of a previous owner. And I always noticed that he had back discomfort. He was always swishing his tail when I was getting on, and he just seemed really uncomfortable. And I thought it was due to a poorly fitting saddle. So finally, the problems consisted, and at the urge of a trainer, I got his back x-rayed, and we found out he had kissing spine. Mm -hmm. And so how would someone know if their horse was affected by kissing spine? Well, the only true way to diagnose kissing spine is through radiographs or your veterinarian. They're overriding dorsal spinous processes, and it manifests itself in many different symptoms that you'll see on the ground as mm -hmm. the rider. Um, it can just be irritable when you're grooming the back or you're having mounting issues or it can get really dangerous with bucking, rearing, <laughs> and being explosive and unpredictable. When you talk about being explosive and unpredictable, I mean, that, that's really dangerous. That means that even though you're a great rider, there's some things that you just can't deal with. Yeah, and your horse could injure itself or easily injure you. It got to the point with my horse where I couldn't ride him anymore. It was just getting very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of a process of elimination, I guess, to try to figure out if this is in fact kissing spine disease? Yeah, and there's actually, we have a few pictures of some radiographs that can kind of give you an inside view of what, what you would see. Mm -hmm. um, the, on the next slide, we actually have the, the radiograph that shows a, quote, normal spine. Mm -hmm. And if you see, those are actually three pasted together complements of Dr. Randy France. And on the left, that's where the withers or the saddle would fit the f left in the center one. Mm -hmm. And you can see the spinous process is the top. That's under, that's under your horse's skin and muscle. And right there is, on the left would be the neck beyond that, on the yep. right on the would tail. Mm -hmm. And so you can see the spaces between the spinous processes. Okay. And, and that's just great. But then on the next one, you can see the next slide, you can see more of Ooh. what happens. And that's actually the type of thing that Melissa's horse had. Yeah, so you can see the loss of bone density and how close the processes are together, which can be extremely painful for the horse. Some horses don't display any symptoms and they're totally fine with this, but most of them, it's extremely painful for them. I was gonna say, so what about possible treatments? I mean, we're talking about the spine. I mean, starting off with the easy things that you can do is trying different saddles, getting the help of a professional saddle fitter. So the pressure's on different parts. Yeah, so balancing the saddle on the horse's back and that can really make a huge difference. That combined with retraining by strengthening the horse's back using things like the Pessoa lunging system mm -hmm. in that bottom right hand corner where you're doing long and low techniques with the horse to help build up the muscle and strengthen the back. Mm -hmm. um, there's also more non-invasive things like cold laser therapy, uh, where the light will interact with the tissue simulating the natural biological processes and that'll help reduce the inflammation and manage the pain. Mm -hmm. And so this would be something that you'd be doing ongoing? Um, usually it's used for seven days initially to help reduce the inflammation, but it can also be used ongoing on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And so are there other options? Uh, there are a few other options. You can do corticosteroid and serapin combination of injections. That is commonly done in horses, but they do need to be repeated every three to four months. Tildren is a new drug that's been developed in Europe. It can actually help remodel the bone and stop the bone loss, but it's pretty expensive 
and is only imported by certain vets. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to contact your veterinarian and that has to be injected every six to 12 months usually. And then there are also two surgical options. There's the old style surgery where they're actually removing every other vertebrae. It's highly invasive, it's prone to infection, and it's a long recovery period. I would guess so. Yeah. <laughs> so that's usually not happening anymore now. There's the new style surgery, which has only been in the United States for the past year or two, where it's done while the horse is standing, but sedated, and mm -hmm. they're small one centimeter incisions. Um, a lot less uh, as far as drastic on removal, like more like um, clipping rather than cutting mm -hmm. off or removing. Wow. And so yeah. tell me a little bit about your experience with your horse. Did you try all these things and, and did you eventually have to have surgery? We tried different saddles. We tried injections. Nothing seemed to manage the pain for him. I, I don't know if he was just a big baby about it. <laughs> but So I finally resorted to stop riding him and then I started driving because he drives as well so mm -hmm. he had discomfort with that as well so I finally just said I'll try the surgery it has a 95 percent success rate you know this is the, this is it and they do it at Tufts um, veterinary school so it was a close ride for me mm -hmm. and it's a eight-week recovery period one month you're hand walking twice a day, the second month you're lunging once a day, and then at the end of eight weeks you should be back on your horse. And so how's he doing? Well, we had a little <laughs> sidetrack in our rehabilitation <laughs> oh, no. process. He injured his suspensory ligament, which is about a six month recovery from that. And for people who don't know anything about horses, what is a suspensory ligament? Well, it's, it's in it was his hind leg, right? It's in the front leg. It's in his front leg because he basically just straining something in a, what would we would think of as like the calf mm -hmm. area oh, okay. as far as you know height, mm -hmm. and it's just rest. And so, and in fact, that's the kind of things that Dr. Phil talked to us about before with right. using the shock wave treatment and yep. things. So. And so Betsy, Melissa is making a presentation on kissing spine at the annual Everything Equine and Canine event at the end of this month. Yeah, she's actually doing that with Dr. Phil. He's going to help on the vet veterinary side and answering questions there. And she's, it's all part of her internship. So this is going to be great experience. And of course, this is part of the experience right here, mm -hmm. uh, getting exposure to all different aspects of the putting on an event and, and then planning, organizing, carrying it out. And I think by the time she's done, she will have extreme <laughs> knowledge of every aspect and may choose not to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just as important too, to it rule is. out things that you know you, know you don't want to do. It is, because she's found out uh, what most people don't realize, what goes on behind the scenes to get something this large organized. Mm -hmm. And so as far as you know, putting together this presentation on Kissing Spine, I mean, Clearly, you have an experience with it that a lot of people don't, so that you can better explain it. It's not a great thing, but I mean, yeah. I guess it's sort of, you know, interesting to you, so you could probably make it very interesting to other people. Yeah, it, it's very interesting to me. I mean, you can learn something from every horse, whether it's something great, winning ribbons in a show ring, or just learning about these different diseases. So. Um, it's it's been a great experience. <laughs> and so what's the sort of long-term prognosis? I know every horse is different, every case is different, but is this something that you think he's going to uh, recover from and be fine? Well, most of the treatments that we are mentioning are just managing the pain and mm -hmm. trying to get around what's going on in the horse's back. The two surgical options are supposed to heal the horse and open up that space between the vertebrae. Mm -hmm. So usually horses have about two centimeters of space and he only had a half a centimeter. Wow. So they're really hoping that it opens up to one centimeter, one and a half, and it seems like it has, so now it just might be a little bit of a mental factor. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and that's a whole nother show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we'll have more on everything equine and canine on, on Across the Fence in the next week or two leading up to the April 26th and 27th event. I want to thank you both for joining me today. Absolutely. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.